that I may not be the man I was once, but I can be the man that I was once if you give me a chance. <laughs> Twice if you give me enough time. <laughs> oh, a great guy. Y'all will love Tony. Really do. Great. Hello, Facebook. Hello, YouTube. We are Hello. now streaming. Hello, Thanks for everyone. joining us this evening. Okay, very good. Are they muted right now? They, so uh, we always give, we, you know, log on to Facebook and YouTube a couple minutes before we let everyone in the Zoom room just to make sure the connection is okay. And so if they're watching on Facebook right now, they get, they get a little preview, a little sneak peek. <laughs> I hope we get a good response from the um, Vietnam War History Org channel uh, site because they got 36,000 members and a lot of them are Vietnam veterans and anyone can, of course, uh, join the site and everything, but it's uh, uh, they're very strict on the rules. It has to be about Vietnam. And uh, I've had some great interviews like World War II vets or Korean vets from, and it's no no on that channel. but. Uh, very, very dedicated, and thank God that they have that channel, and I wish them the very best. Uh, I don't know what you're going to do if you have 36,000 people log in. That would be incredible. You know, our cap is 500, so yeah, that would be incredible. Everybody will have to pop over and watch us on Facebook oh. if we're on at okay, capacity. Okay, now I'm, I'm getting room. a little nervous. <laughs> yeah, I, I, can't, I can't say we'll have that many, but <laughs> dare to dream. I think we're just about ready to get started. Sure. I'll start this music. Let's do it. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to VBC uh, for Thursday, May 13th. My name is Sean Hall. Uh, I'm just here to welcome you to our new program, A Veteran's Story with Pete Mecca. Uh, a couple announcements here before we jump right over to Pete. Uh, first, I want to ask Ellie, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. I'm uh, in front of my How Long Bay background. <laughs> instead of and Chicago. Todd made it to Chicago yeah Todd made it to Chicago he did, okay. yes he did yeah Good. he's at the Pritzker right now at the Bill Malden exhibit well it's not an excuse to miss VBC but if he That's has to, true. Pritzker is a pretty good, pretty good excuse. Um, for those of you joining us for the very first time, uh, we would love to send you uh, one of our magazines. We've been producing this for several years, but uh, it was a it was a newsletter before it became a magazine. Uh, gracing the front cover is our very own Julia Parsons. She recently celebrated her 100th birthday. She uh, was a part of World War II in cracking the Enigma Code. Uh, it's an incredible magazine. If we don't end up, we don't know you, uh, please, um, you know, we're welcome. And uh, please put your email into the chat or send it to either Ellie or I, and we would love to get you in our mailing list so you can find out about all of the upcoming programs that we have. We usually come on Monday nights for a happy hour at 7 p.m. Eastern time uh, and Wednesday mornings at uh, 9 a.m. I was going to say 7 a.m., but that's way too early for me. Uh, 9 a.m. Eastern time for our coffee hour. Uh, different things that we have coming up. We are going to be celebrating Maritime Day uh, this coming Monday. Um, we have one of the final remaining Tuskegee Airmen joining us in a couple weeks. Uh, super exciting programs on the horizon for VBC. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it right over to uh, the host of this new program. And we're so excited for the, the talk that we're going to have tonight by uh, he and our special guest. And I'll let Pete go ahead and introduce you. Pete, how are you tonight? Okay, doing fine there, Sean. How are you, sir? I'm great. I, you know, Congratulations on this new program. Super excited to have you on board. Thank you. All right. Hello, America. Listen, welcome to a veteran story on the Veterans Breakfast Club .org. Um, Lieutenant Michael Blassie was shot down on May 11th, 1972, near An Lok, Vietnam, while on a strafing run behind the controls of his A-37B Dragonfly. Michael was listed as killed in action, body not recovered. But his remains had indeed been recovered identified, then basically shelved and forgotten. Through mistakes and mismanagement, Michael's remains were eventually discovered buried at the Tomb of the Unknown in Arlington National Cemetery. 
His sister, Colonel Patricia Blassie, herself, a 40-year career Air Force veteran, will tell us the story tonight of a family search for the truth, the search for a son and a brother. It is an honor for me to introduce Colonel Patricia Blassie. Welcome to the show, Patricia. <laughs> Thank you, Pete. Oh my goodness, I, I so appreciate and I feel very privileged to join you this evening. I, um, I look inside and go, um, it's amazing that I'm even here, but you invited me. And I was looking at, um, before we came on, I was looking at your um, book, um, Fights Like a Girl, that was just published, right? Um, yeah. And so I, I also reread <laughs> um, some of the things that I said in there. And um, for me, I joined the Air Force at 17 years old. I was enlisted. I turned 18 in basic training, as you know. Um, and um, they promised me education, travel, and training. And the Air Force lived up to that promise. Um, but you allowed me to tell some of my story in this book. And if that means I was trained to fight like a girl, you know, to, to join the Air Force, which I didn't have any idea that it was an anomaly that girls, women joined the Air Force at the time. And it was, um, I, I then, because I am one, then I did the best of my ability um, right alongside the best airmen um, ever, you know? So I, I so appreciate you telling stories like this and then allowing other veterans and um, people to share their stories, just like what the Veterans Breakfast Club is all about. I read the vision and the mission and, um, there are living histories. Every veteran today and in days gone by has a story and they should never be forgotten, right? And I, you stand for that. This club stands for that. And I thank you. I thank you for inviting me um, to come along with you. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I always love your story. I've always preached and I will preach until the day I die that if you make it out of boot camp, you have a story to tell. <laughs> uh, I, I did see one uh, Navy veteran from World War II, had a hat on, United States Navy, World War II. And I asked him, I said, uh, you served in World War II, I'd like to interview you. He said, no, I don't have a story to tell. I said, well, do, were you on a ship? Yeah, but I don't have a story to tell. I wasn't nothing but a cook. I said, well, what ship were you on? He said, the Gambier Bay. I uh -huh. said, the Gambier Bay was sunk at Let Take Go. He said, yeah, we got sunk and I went to the water, but I don't have a story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> if you may not boot camp, you have a story. Patricia, I'm gonna turn the program basically over to you. I'll interrupt a little bit, maybe ask a question, but I want you to go ahead and tell the story. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Sure. I believe I've been taught well how to do this. <laughs> Yes, it's um, all I, about checking that little box in the left corner with yep, share, share sound. sound. And um, I, I believe that um, this is what I really want, what I really want on there. And I'm going to do this. Sorry. And so um, thank you again um, to the Veterans Breakfast Club um, for allowing me to be a part of your effort to connect people, educate them, heal them, and inspire. Um, because as my journey has gone on, that is exactly, um, and I don't know um, if I will ever be completely healed, you know, with what has happened in my life, but it, it's a journey and I am very thankful to be a part of what you're doing. So um, I am going to um, just start with, this family circus a cartoon that Bill Keene published in November of 1997. And as you see, it's 
the Tomb of the Unknowns, uh, the child is saying, why don't they check his DNA? And I called Mr. Keene and I was like, did you know what my family was doing, is doing? Um, you know, and I was like, I was amazed. And he said, no. He said, I believed that a child would ask the question someday that who is in the tomb and why don't they check his DNA? But that's what my family was going through. And I will tell you that story. Um, but I will tell you this too. Um, Mr. Keene said to me, it was one of the most controversial cartoons to at that time that he had ever published because who would ever ask that the tomb be even, well, whatever you want to call it, open, um, viol violated, some people call that. I mean, there were a lot of things that um, my family heard um, throughout the day, but he heard it, and um, but it was true. And um, so I will go on from there. I will just tell you a little bit about my brother, Michael. We grew up in St. Louis to George and Jean Blassey. He was the oldest of five children. Um, Michael, um, that was Michael, then Judy, Mary, Miss the middle, I'm number four. And then George was the youngest. He went to St. Louis University. He got an appointment to the Air Force Academy. The family could never have been so proud. And, you know, if he was the first, I don't even, I think the first to go to college, I, I think, um, of the Blassie family. But um, then off um, to pilot training because he fell in love with um, flying while he was at the Academy. We were so proud of him. And we, so anytime that Michael did anything, and just so you know, um, we went to his uh, graduation at the Academy. We all got in the car from St. Louis, went to Colorado. When he got his pilot wings, we all got in the car. We went down to Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi. And it was, it was really all about Michael, but not just because um, my mom and dad, uh, he was the firstborn, and there is something about firstborn, but we all loved him, and we all looked up to him, and there's my brother George at the time, the day Michael got his wings, but then it was just like um, we were celebrating all the time about Michael, and then from there, um, Michael went on to Vietnam, so when the last day that we saw Michael, um, it was a back in the day when we could go to his, to the aircraft and we could say goodbye at the aircraft. And, you know, when I was um, 14 and he was 24 years old at the time, and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, my brother's leaving, but we never talked about the seriousness of war. And I did not realize that this might be the last time I saw Michael, but he looked back and he smiled and um, that smile. And it was just like, okay, that's my brother. Um, but he went to survival training. He was with the 8th Special Operations Squadron at Benoit Air Base in uh, Vietnam, and he flew the A-37 Dragonfly. And I can't tell, uh, again, how proud uh, we were of him, but on his 132nd mission while flying over Anlock, um, the fire, it was one of the most intense battles of the Vietnam War. Um, and while flying, he, he was Hawk, um, zero two. Hawk zero one was the flight lead and the flight lead went up. Michael went down um, to drop his bombs is the way I understand it. And, um, it, but he was shot down by ground enemy fire. When um, he was hit, there was no, there was streaming fuel. There was no communication. Um, and then the plane inverted and he went down with that, with his aircraft. It was, um, to hear about it, it was quite devastating. And yes, back in the day, there were, um, there was a telegram um, uh, to my family. And I just, um, I look back on that, that time, it's, it's difficult, but um, 
I just, um, I remember when the Air Force team came to my home that day, um, they picked up my father first. They went to get my mother. She was working at the time. And then they came back to the home. And then all of us gathered there and they told us about what happened to Michael. It's just like what you see in the movies, um, that whatever service the um, person who is either injured or um, killed, that service team will come to the home. It, um, I, it was, um, they try to talk to you, but when I was so young, I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and so, but what they, what I understand today that he was a part of Operation Linebacker One. He was shot down by ground enemy fire. It was 60 miles north of Saigon and Anlock. His body could not be recovered and his designation was KIA BNR, killed in action, body not recovered. The reason why he was, um, his body could not re be recovered because of the intensity of, the, of that day of the war that day, the helicopters went in to get him. Uh, and that's what they do. They either pull you out if you're alive or they recover you if you're not, but they couldn't, their lives were in jeopardy. And so um, they had to leave that mission, but this is what we were told because the flight lead saw him go down. There was no communication and he saw the plane crash. And so that's what we lived with. Um, there was a newspaper article um, about this in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, but one of the quotes is um, what Michael said, um, why am I trying to live if I'm just living to die? I'll keep on living um, if as long as there's a fighting reason to live or for others to live. And I respect that. And because the class of 1970, he, which he was a part of um, as he came out of the academy, they knew they were going to go to war. And they knew it was, you know, they, well, they just knew. And, but he had a view of what he was doing that was, um, was very respectful, I thought, because when I studied the war, when I went to the Air War College um, years later, many years later than when Michael was killed and after the Vietnam War, I was devastated by what I heard and found out and studied about the implications of the war and the decisions that were made. So when I look at my brothers who is frozen in time at 24 years old, <laughs> what he said, I, I so respect that. And I'm, I'm glad that he stood strong as, he, as all the Vietnam veterans did, um, no matter what they thought about the war which is the, the kind of people that we need in our nation today. So anyway, I went down a rabbit hole. Pete, you got to stop me if I do that. So well, you're doing fine. Continue on. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was in 1972. In 1973, um, a little more than a year later, um, there was a dedication at uh, Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi, where Michael went to pilot training. And um, there was a dedication of a building to Michael's name. So we all got in the, we all got in the car. We went back down to Mississippi and we were there for that dedication, aunts and uncles and all of us. And we wouldn't have thought of anything else. Um, there was not, nothing else more important, but that was in 1973. But, um, but because that was so important to us is because there were, Michael had not come home. He, the, we, we were still wondering the rest of the story, right? So I am going to skip forward 1973 to 1984. And many of you probably remember this. Um, uh, there was a Memorial Day ceremony. Um, they, they had identified an unknown soldier from to represent Vietnam. They put him on a ship from the Central Identification Lab in Hawaii, and the ship went over um, to uh, California at Travis Air Force Base. 
California. He, uh, the unknown soldier laid in state at the chapel. From there, he was put on a C-130, I mean, um, C-141, which is no longer, we don't have those anymore, but, there, but um, he was on a C-141 um, and traveled from Travis Air Force Base to our nation's capital, where all the unknown soldiers from World War I, World War II, Korea, and now Vietnam laid in state at the Capitol to be honored prior to the big ceremony on Memorial Day of 1984. You can see the parade. You can see the, um, the people lining the streets. It was a grand day. This was one of the most important um, things that our government had done for our Vietnam veterans. They, the, the wall had already been built, the Vietnam Wall, with all of the names of those who had uh, served and had given their lives for our nation. But this is what, this is, that was a nonprofit. Um, it was not governmental. This was uh, from our government to appoint an unknown soldier and bring him to Arlington Cemetery to lay it, to um, be buried with the other unknown soldiers from the other wars. So it was a, quite the day. And as I look at these pictures, even now, <laughs> I just, I just am like, oh my goodness. And so uh, President Reagan presided over the ceremony. You'll notice that it's a multi-service color guard because we don't know the service um, uh, of the of who was interred, uh, uh, who was named as the unknown soldier, and um, it was a grand day um, for our nation. Uh, President Reagan wanted to heal our nation. We were divided. The war, so. In 1973, Congress said there would be an unknown soldier. They, um, in a, a, a couple of years later, there was a crypt placed at the Tomb of the Unknowns for a Vietnam unknown soldier. But it wasn't until 1984 that there was one, an unknown soldier identified to be placed in the tomb. And, um, and it was a healing effort for President Reagan to, um, because th there was such a strong um, uh, vibe, I don't know if it's a vibe, a strong push from the veterans. What about Vietnam? We didn't treat our veterans right, and we don't have an unknown. And so there were so many dynamics and implications President Reagan presided over this ceremony and he accepted the flag for the nation as a family would, he did that. And he also presented the Medal of Honor um, as all the unknowns were presented. Each one has a Congressional Medal of Honor because they were selected to serve in the tomb. Um, but not for the not just because of their service during the war, but because they were selected. And so it was a great honor for Vietnam veterans. It was a great honor for our nation. And I think that um, it was a, a wonderful thing looking back of what President Reagan wanted to do. I'm going to now go, that was 1984, and now I'm going to go to a 19. 86, when a, a book was published, A Missing Plane, by Susan Sheehan. And in this book, um, Susan Sheehan had, talks about how remains were covered. She, she went out to the Central Identification Lab in Hawaii. She uh, met with them, uh, how they were re identifying remains from the Vietnam War, how all of that was working. And so, but in this book, there's just two or three pages that talks about the unknown soldier from Vietnam. And it talks about the date the unknown um, was killed, where the unknown um, was killed, what artifacts 
uh, were found. And so, I, I mean, I could read it to you and, and I don't wanna belabor it, but the date was May 11th of 1972. Where was it Anne Locke, 60 miles north of Saigon? Um, what artifacts were found? I have them here. I, I wish I could show them, but I, I don't know how to do that by Zoom. But uh, the life raft, the portions of the parachute, portions of his flight suit, um, of the unknown's flight suit, and um, all of them from the United States Air Force that that is is printed on the life raft and the and the parachute and. Um, and it's the kind of artifacts that were um, on an A-37 because, uh, you know, th they say there was confusion because a C-130 went down the same day, a helicopter went down the same day in different areas and th that, that there was some confusion then when those um, remains were found, um, but the artifacts that were found were Air Force and what was would have been um, carried on an A-37. The, in this book, the approximate age and height, the designation was AX-26, and it also talks about the number of bones that were found um, on, that, that were found as well. So I don't wanna belabor that anymore. Now I'm going to that all of that that I just talked to you about it was unbeknownst to our family. But the first call that my mother received was in 1994. She received the call from Ted Sampley, who was he uh, not arguably truly um, was a um, just a rebel. He was um, he believed that we left POWs and MIAs in in uh, Vietnam. He was a Green Beret in Vietnam. He uh, protested. He would do everything um, to talk about what our government did. But in 1994, he called my mom and he said, Mrs. Plassey, I'm Ted Sampley. And we did not know anything about him at the time. We didn't really know that there were all these groups out there and people that were the National League of Families we knew about, but other groups that were just uh, rolling thunder, they were all out there saying, hey, there's something, there's something um, going on. But Ted was like, Mrs. Blassie, I read this book, uh, The Missing Plane, and I am going to write this article um, but I want you to know, I believe your son, after reading the book and, and doing some research, that your son is in the Tomb of the Unknowns. Well, in the meantime, my mother was getting letters from the government saying that, um, you know, we're going to go back into Vietnam and find, you know, there's a, there's a mission going back in to find Michael. So I was like, my mom sent him to me and um, I was a captain at the time. And I, I said, Mr. Sampley, you know, I appreciate this. I, I don't know you, but I will do some research. And so I called the Air Force um, Personnel Center down at Randolph, which is still there today. And I said, this is what's being said. Is this true? And um, they said, by no means, uh, the casualty office representative said, by no means is there anything to substantiate that your brother's in the tomb of the unknowns. And I said, thank you, because that's the craziest story or thought that I could ever imagine. I, I just I, I, I just can't fathom that. And so um, I saluted smartly and I, you know, I have thoughts about what I, how I handled that now that so many years later, but that's what I did. But then in 1997, I received another call from Vince Gonzalez, who is a, was an investigative reporter. He said, I know about Ted Sampley's past. I know about um, a, a, a Susan Sheehan's book. I know about the article that Ted um, wrote and what is being said but I believe it's true. And I was like, well, my mom can't get these kinds of phone calls. I mean, it's her first, her firstborn. And no matter what, you know, if it's somebody, it's somebody. And it, 
if there's uh, the trail leads to the tomb, then let, let, let's go ahead and uh, investigate that. So my mother, um, she was convinced it was her son, you know, that intuition, <laughs> I have not had children, but I'll tell you, it was strong from her. She uh, signed an affidavit to allow Vince um, in the Freedom of Information Act to gain any uh, documents um, with Michael's name on them so that he could research what is true. And, and this was the most interesting thing because um, what we weren't told about Michael was that a Vietnamese reconnaissance team went into Michael's crash site on October 31st of 1972, just five, is it six, five months later uh, after Michael was killed in May. And Army office, US Army officers were with this Vietnamese reconnaissance team. They were sent to Michael's crash site. They found remains, they found artifacts, they found his ID card. He was carried out of, um, of Vietnam of uh, Ann Lock, and he was flown to the U.S. mortuary, which, which was then at that time located in Saigon. So when we saw these documents, and I'll just, I don't want to belabor the documents. Um, th this is the radio control log. It says, bless the ID card. It, it shows um, the date that he was found. Um, 31 October of 1972. Um, the next uh, very telling uh, document is when he was um, accepted or received at the U.S. mortuary in Saigon. I'm sorry for the way the, the, the certificate looks, but it, it shows that they received him and his ID card and that you know, with Michael Joseph Blassie, first lieutenant, six foot, 200 pounds, you know, and with a mustache. So they received him. That was very important when, as we were doing our research, um, the skeletal chart, um, the, uh, not to offend, um, the blackened part are the, are the remains that were found. Um, and so, and that, this is an interesting point because the, the remains of an unknown soldier um, needed to be 80% found. They had to do a waiver because you can see this was more like 10% because of the blackened areas. That's all that they found of Michael. Um, but um, you'll see that the things that they found at the bottom, the, the remnants of uh, his flight suit, the inflatable raft, an ammo pouch. I, I have remnants of the parachute. Um, that is all true. But they started saying BTB. I was like, what is that? Well, it's believed to be. So uh, for whatever reason, that, and I, I, don't, I haven't gotten to the bottom and then maybe I'll never understand it, but they started questioning who this person was. But going back to when they found him, you know, usually they tell the family they found, even if there's questions, but they didn't. And so um, when we're looking at these documents, we're like, wow, well, there's a lot of decisions that were being made on behalf of my mother and father. Um, so, and then I'm going to skip forward to 1978. Um, the uh, expert in um, identifying remains back then, they didn't have DNA. So it's like some kind of anthropology, uh, anthropological um, uh, narrative that they would look at to show how tall you are and how old you are. And this document was that the, Michael's age was estimated to be 26 to 33 years old. And Michael was 24 years old. The living stature, um, his height was between 65.2 or 71.5, uh, and Michael was 72 inches tall, and a small quantity of hair, light brown, um, from 
the flight suit um, was found and they did a test on the hair and it didn't match Michael's blood. And so, but you got, um, I always have to remind myself, Michael was found in the jungle. I mean, I feel like it's a jungle, but it, it's not a jungle anymore, but um, he was found in 1972 and they're talking about a hair and it didn't match Michael's blood. So I just, I was like, and then the sophistication of identification. Um, so they started going into, instead of where someone was found, the ID card and all um, the indications, they started doing their formula and they determined that since Michael didn't meet the age requirement, he was two years younger, 24. And um, since he was um, a half an inch taller than the height range and that the blood type of that hair, whosoever it was, um, they made a determination to um, recommend that Michael's name be taken away the, from those remains. And, and, that, and that is what is what happened. Two years later, he met a board um, and they looked at all of the evidence that was put before them and um, they made a determination to take Michael's name away from those remains. They all signed it and they named those remains X26. And that was in 1980. Um, so I... Um, I, I, I want to just a couple more documents. Um, there, after that at the ASCRO board, um, the Armed Services Graves Re Registration Board um, made that determination. That was in 1980. This uh, document is the Air Force position paper and is um, dated April of 1991. And this position paper from the Air Force said, there, there are no remains at the, um, cent uh, at the Central Identification Lab in Hawaii that meet the criteria of an unknown, unknown but to God. No identification, um, uh, paraphernalia, nothing that would show that um, there is, it could be someone. And, but at the bottom of the, the first page of this, you'll see, you know, they're talking about X. 67, 15, then there's X26, Lieutenant Blassie, 10 to 15% ID card lost. So after his name was taken away from him, they're still talking about Michael Blassie associated with X26. So um, I, 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 um, I, it bothers me that the Air Force didn't stand stronger on their position paper, but what I was told is there was a drive there was a drive for an unknown. And, and, and I understand that to honor our Vietnam veterans, um, but the, the drive to take away um, someone's name really still um, is tough, tough for me because our name is who we are. Um, and, and it goes back to what this organization is all about, honoring veterans who have a story, who have a name. Um, so anyway, this next document, it might not be, that important, but there was um, some research done on the artifacts that were found with this person. Um, and, um, and so they were still at the bottom of this memo. You'll see Stephen Gravrock, who was killed. He was in the class of 70 as one, but he had already been recovered and in interred at the academy, but Michael Blassie was still body not recovered. Um, so that was um, telling to me as well. And then um, I call this a smoking gun got document. Maybe I should um, call it something different. But this was signed on um, Michael's birthday, April 4th, um, uh, but in 1984. It's um, from Johnny Webb, who I've, I, I've talked with him um, since but he still works at the Central Identification Lab. He is a very high ranking civilian. He is a retired Lieutenant Colonel from um, the Army. He um, actually was put in charge of um, the taking the mortuary from the mortuary when we pulled out of 
Vietnam was moved from Saigon to Thailand. When we completely moved out of, um, of Vietnam, um, the mortuary was moved from Thailand to Hawaii. Johnny Webb was in the military as an army officer, and he was in charge of moving the mortuary to, um, to, to, uh, to Hawaii. So he's known Michael for a very long time. But this is the document that we were like, oh my gosh. So he said documents to remove, to be removed from the X26 file and placed in the Blasi file. And it's just the ones that I showed you, the ASCRO board finding that took his name away from him and named him X26. The statement by Captain Hess, who said he received Michael at the mortuary in Saigon, and the journal that said that he was found. And Johnny Webb signed that. And, um, and so we were like, oh my gosh, Michael Blassie and X-26, they are one in the same. Um, there are documents um, that I, I could show you, you know, because everything about an unknown soldier, and, and it, there's, it says um, that you're supposed to destroy everything. You're just, just supposed to destroy anything that whether it's documents or, or anything. And, um, but I will tell you, um, as hard as it is to think about um, what happened, I am so thankful that Johnny Webb didn't destroy everything. And so I have the artifacts and we have the documents which allowed us as a family, unbeknownst to us, any of this, to find Michael. So when we met as a family, I, I, I asked my mom, you know, to call a meeting. Um, so to the left of the screen is Judy, it was Michael and then Judy. And then, um, George is next. He's the youngest. And of my, my mom and then my sister, Mary, she's middle. And then myself, I, I was number four. I am number four. And so we met as a family and we said, what in the world are we going to do? And I, I gave each of them a binder and we looked at the documents. And really, it was the first time that we ever uh, talked about what happened because Back in 72, our family just, we went our own separate ways. It, it wasn't discussed um, like it probably should have been to help us heal. So we, we started healing. We were talking about letters and, and, then, and then we were like, well, what should we do? And, and George was like, um, well, it's such an honor to be buried in such a sacred place. It's the tomb of the unknowns. And we talked about that and it is, but it's the tomb of the unknowns. And then Judy was like, I, I must admit, um, she's very vocal, but we all are, but we do it differently, but we're all very critical. And she just let it out there. Well, I don't think anybody's going to care. No one's cared, you know, up to this point. And, and then Mary was like, um, if I was lost, Michael would come to find me. So she dreamt that he would come walking in someday, you know, because, you know, we didn't have, I don't want to use the word closure. Some people get bothered by it. I don't know another word. We didn't have the finality. Um, and then um, George goes, wait a second, um, Michael is a hero, he deserves to be known. So we talked about that, what's in a name? You know, and, and it, it, it just makes so much sense. You know, our name is who we are. And, and um, so after the bantering of the siblings, my mother, um, was, is, she's such a patient and strong woman. Um, I mean, she, she's passed now, but, um, she just looked at us and after we were done and she just said, I want to bring my son home. I want him with his own tombstone with his name on it. And so <laughs> we looked at each other. I mean, it was a little bit more than that, but we made a pact and said we would stick together. But I, 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 don't, I didn't know what to expect. 
about confronting the government. But what I did know is that I had some semblance of Air Force training <laughs> and I am so grateful to the Air Force. Um, I will for, be forever grateful to the Air Force for my training because I, 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 I understood congressional, I understood communication, I understood media, I understood speaking, I understood writing. And um, not that I was great at it, but um, we went on, on down that road and we did, we went public. And um, on uh, January 19th of 1998, we said the trail leads to the tomb. We wanna know the truth. We wanna bring Michael home. And so um, there was a lot going on at that time. You know, our government was like, uh, they had already been researching it because they had heard you know, you know how things work, I guess, but they had heard we were going to do this and there's all these things going on in the background. There's documents that show that they already were starting to uh, develop their responses. And so, um, but we, we did that. And um, at not long after, even the day after they said, yep, those remains that were in the tomb were previously um, associated with the name Michael Blassie. It didn't take long for them to say that, but um, but in response, they did a, establish a task force. They researched the same documents that we did, but they had more. I know it, and um, and then they interviewed those that were involved that we never had access to. We could never have found Johnny Webb or Casper uh, Weinberger, who was our Secretary of Defense at the time, or, or the Secretary of the Army. They, um, they did not speak with us, but they, they did speak. They did speak with our government to answer those questions. And so um, it wasn't long after that um, the recommendation from the task force um, to the, our former secretary of defense, Will, Will, William Cohen, was to disinter the remains. We as a, a family said, we'll do DNA testing. We didn't quite know, understand that at the time, but we were willing to do that. And my mother was willing to give her blood in order to, um, to identify her son. And she did so. Um, so the, the Secretary of Defense um, said, we will open the tomb. The Air Force sent a team to my mother's home to um, get her sample to um, bring, to see if her DNA matched the remains that were in the tomb. It's mitochondrial DNA, which is derived from the, the female line. And so that's the kind of uh, test that it was. Um, and they started the process of disinterring the Vietnam unknown, but they said it was, sacred gown. So no media was able to see, but I will assure you, and I've talked to the old guard, they, um, they never gave up their mission. They guarded that tomb throughout this whole process. It was so important to them um, uh, to ensure that that would never um, interrupt their mission as a guard. But anyway, so, um, this was the night of May 13th of 1998. The middle crypt, if you look at, I should have um, talked about this earlier. If you look at the tomb and it's the one, the, uh, the tomb that is outside, um, it says known but to God, that's World War I. There's three crypts in front of that. And in the middle crypt was the Vietnam unknown. And as you see here, they um, are working to disinter um, Michael. So there was a marble um, slab. They didn't um, anticipate an incredible uh, concrete slab after that. Um, bringing that up, they worked through the night because the ceremony on May 14th it was the very next morning um, for the disinterment ceremony. Here is the casket. Um, it is worn. 
um, I wanted to be there, but I, at the time they said no, because we don't know that you're a family member. And, and, and I really believed that I, I was, I was distrustful in some ways, in a lot of ways, but I, I thought that the ID card would be in the tomb with these remains. Um, but that wasn't the case. I still don't know where the ID card is, but you'll see that um, they were very meticulous. And I uh, seeing these photos helped me um, uh, with this process. So the next morning during the disinterment ceremony, this is how the, um, the area at the tomb looked. They cleaned it up. You would never have known there was um, all of that work that was going on. Um, Secretary Cohen presided over the disinterment ceremony. You'll see that there is still a multi-service color guard. Um, and the remains arrived at the Air Force Institute of Pathology. You'll see that there's still a multi-service color guard um, transporting the remains of the unknown soldier. This is just a photo of um, as they took out the remains and what the casket looked like. So maybe that was good. It was, um, there's a lot of wear and tear going on. I don't know. Um, the scientists at the lab received, it was a blind analysis. Um, Dr. Mitch Holland, um, he was in charge of this, um, of this uh, test. They received two cases. Um, almost identical, um, so that the scientists would not know who it was. But I'll tell you, these scientists back in the day, 1998, it was one of the closest matches that they had ever seen. Um, and so they were very excited about their, their science. Secretary Cohen called my mother on June 30th to tell her that she could finally bring her son home after 26 years of waiting for the rest of the story. It was a grand day. We were inside and the media was outside waiting. Um, it was just a crazy time dealing with all of the dynamics. Um, but I, I will show you this picture because this picture is one of the um, happiest pictures that I have of my entire family who's living today <laughs> and because we won, we found him, right? And then, um, but then we were very sad um, because, oh my goodness, it's true, you know, he was killed. So, but um, I always go back to the truth is difficult to deal with, um, but I'd rather know the truth and deal with it. And so uh, we were very thankful as a family. Um, my brother, George, he was not military. You'll notice that this is a, um, an all Air Force team now. Um, he escorted Michael, his brother, um, for the first time ever being on a military aircraft, was able to escort his brother home. This is the day George got his wings. You know, if you, if you think back um, to the picture that when Michael got his wings that George was um, so small. And so now it changed. So it was a very exciting and proud day and George still um, lives, with, lives with that. So the next day we buried Michael at Jefferson Barracks um, National Cemetery. Then Secretary of Defense and Mrs. Cohen came Rudy de Leon, who um, was in charge of the task force, he's there on the left side of the screen, he came. Um, people who um, flew with Michael, academy graduates, the lady that we thought would marry him, um, a lot of Vietnam veterans who had never um, been able to bury their buddy and say goodbye came, people we, we were told there's four to 5,000 people that were there. And um, so it was a different kind of day, but it was a day that for each person in their own right um, of what they were experiencing and why they were there. Um, but we were, we were very, very thankful um, uh, to finally bring Michael home because they said, well, where do you wanna bury him? You want to bury him in Arlington? And we said, move him from the tomb to Arlington? No, 
we meant we want to bring Michael home. So, and that is what we did. So um, what I would like to do, and I'm hopeful that this will work. I would like to show you a short video and then um, I will conclude. I, I will conclude. I'm going to go ahead and and you, Sean, you'll tell me, or Ellie, you'll tell me if I need to do something else. Um, uh, if I needed to escape here, yep. And and this video is of um, a lady named Gina Pascal came. She's an inspirational artist. CBS Local News put. Um, video from the ceremony that day over um, the song that she sang. And so I hope that this will give you a somewhat. His back is bent and weary. His voice is tired and low. His sword is worn from battle and his steps have gotten slow but he used to walk on water or it seemed that way to me I know he moved some mountains and never left his knee strike up the bay assemble the choir brother for what he believed and I love my brother because he believed in America. His memory lives on. I love Michael. He is a great man. He faced the winds of sorrow but his heart knew no retreat. He walked in narrow places knowing Christ knew no defeat. But now his steps turn homeward, so much closer to the prize. He's sounding kind of homesick, there's a longing in his eyes. Strike up the band, assemble the choir. Another Representative as the unknown soldier. 
And I'm sorry if I'm getting a little quiver lip. This is hard to talk about. He was that good. He really was. I appreciate um, you allowing me to share this story, and I really am thankful for the opportunity, Pete, and um, to this club um, to keep memories alive. And it's just not about my goal. I mean, there are people who are still waiting for their loved one to come home and and to know the rest of the story. And my heart does go out. Um, to everyone. Um, this was a difficult journey, but it was one, like I said, I wouldn't want to, to change. And my, my family stood strong um, together. And um, I just, and I stand here before you, thanking you, let, allowing me to tell the story. So. That's wonderful. Patricia, thank you so much. We have a, a question from Mary. Uh, Mary, come on. Hi, uh, Colonel Blassie, I wanted to thank you for sharing that story. Um, I'm a tour guide in the Baltimore, D.C. area, and uh, I do tours of Arlington maybe 25, 30 times a year. And I want you to know that I talk about your brother every single time when I go to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And so for my part, and I would say for the majority of my fellow guides, your brother will never be forgotten. Oh, thank you, Mary. That was, it was, that was really beautiful. I was really tearing up with that, that last bit. Thank you. I appreciate what you do as well. I mean, it means the world to, to the people who come and they, and to help them understand. And I don't think a lot of them do until they're standing there. And I don't explain the ceremony to them. I talk to them afterwards and ask them what they saw and did they notice this or did they notice that, how he's there to protect the tomb and not us you know, cause the guns on the outside and it's, it's, it's very emotional. And a lot of people do get it after they've been there. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much. And thank you for your service as well. No, thank you. And, and it goes back to every person on that wall uh, and even in the tomb today, um, they have a name and they have family members and they, I mean, it, it, it's just, um, it just keeps going on and on the way that, I mean, we should, we shouldn't understand that, but when somebody dies and, and it's not a part of us, we think, oh, okay, but it's good to understand that it is. Uh, Patricia, I got a question for you. The South Vietnamese patrol and American advisors found the remains six months after the crash. Yet the Lassie family didn't know that for 26 years. Right. What were your feelings about that? So I, I struggle with that. I, um, I struggle with it a lot. Um, but I, I will, I, I, I didn't mention this um, during the talk that there was a man um, named William Parnell. He was a captain at the time. He was part of that Vietnamese reconnaissance team. He was one of the U.S. Army officers. He went into that crash site and he received and he said those remains and he said he bundled them up respectfully and put them on the helicopter to go to Saigon when he saw Michael's picture come up um and that we were saying hey he's in the tomb of the unknowns he just couldn't believe it he and I were in contact um a lot during that whole process he came to the funeral um I mean yeah, Michael's last uh, to final resting place at Jefferson Barracks to make sure that his job really was done this time. Um, but I, I, I can't, I can't explain. I can't get there in my own mind um, why they didn't tell the family. Families can handle information. I believe that, and. Um, even if they had a, you know, a little bit of a doubt or that, you know, they said, oh, the ID card, you know, was separated, but the documents were clear. When we looked at the documents and, and we're just a small family that, you know, we're not sophisticated or anything. And, and it was like, we, 
we know it's him. <laughs> you know? So um, I, I, I struggled with that, Pete. I still struggle with it today. But back in the day when I was young, I was, um, uh, I was, didn't, I was getting bitter. And I was like, how could, how could our government do that? How could our, you know, how could this happen? And I was ready to take the uniform off. And um, my testimony is, you know, the Lord got a grip on me. You know, you, you don't, and it's, it's a terrible, um, I forget what they call them. Don't uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know, kind of thing, you know, cause if I would have done that, I, you know, I just would have not um, been able to progress and move forward. So what I had to learn is um, more like um, men do this, and I've learned to do it a little bit. They come compartmentalize. This was a situation, and I. But I was letting it bleed into every area of my life, and I. I was like, this isn't doing well for me. I'm going down, you know, because I'm. This is not good. So. Um, I learned better how to compartmentalize and say, this is what happened, deal with what happened, learn from it, and then don't allow it to happen if, you know, as an officer in, under any of your watch of what you can control, but not let it bleed and, and, and you know, take me down these rabbit holes that, so um, it, I, I'm a stronger person. I am grown. I mean... I was 40 then, I'm 62, almost 63 now. <laughs> so, yay, I'm a little bit. <laughs> well, I have one more question that I think it's extraordinary. And they had artifacts in the coffin with your brother. Yes. They were not supposed to be there. Right. Tell the story about how they got into the coffin. So um, I sort of alluded to, if I didn't explain, um, that there's a document that said everything should be destroyed, and uh, including um, the, uh, the artifacts. It's very clear. Um, and so when they opened the tomb, which I, I shared with you, I, I wasn't able to be there. But um, when they came to my mother's home and they were telling about the DNA and, you know, and, and telling her she could bring her son home. And, um, and then at the end, an army, uh, I mean, an Air Force officer came up and said, um, so when we opened the tomb, the artifacts were in there. What would you like us to do with the artifacts? And I was like, oh my gosh, we want those. <laughs> There's nothing we don't have anything else, you know? Um, so what I, what I did after all was said and done, I called Johnny Webb out at the Central Identification Lab. And I said, he finally accepted my call. Um, and I said, Mr. Webb, I, I, I'm calling to say thank you. And, you know, cause usually it wasn't a thank you that he would get because he was in the mix, he's in the mix. He knows everything. And I said, I just want to thank you for um, placing those artifacts in with Michael's remains and, and that you didn't destroy them. You know, he abided by all the other things that the government and the uh, higher ups requested of him, but he didn't do that. He was and, court martial offense. I'm sorry. He could, been, he could have been court martialed for what he did. Well, he, I think he was a, at that, I, I think at that point he might have been a civilian. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> he, he says, I think he had already retired and this is a, <laughs> as a civilian now, but I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. But he told me, he said, Pat, when, when um, the White House calls, and, you know, they said, they said this in their book. It said, Johnny Webb and Tadeo Fury, that was the um, expert on identifying remains, refused to discuss the Vietnam unknown. Um, they were asked to go to Washington and they refused to go. Um, he, Fury, 
that expert believed that if additional remains of X26 were ever found, he could identify them. Um, so, but he said, I, had a, I have a family. Um, I, at a certain point, you know, the pressure I think is tough. And so I talked to my family about that. And, I, you know, I, I think that it is tough, the pressures that are put on us in different ways, but I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I can't live it for him, but that's how it, it played out, so. Patricia, your mother actually received criticism for wanting to bring her son home. Is that even explainable? So I, I um, <laughs> thankfully she was mostly shielded from, um, because, uh, you know, we would take the media questions or, but um, they, they just couldn't believe. And, and at first the Vietnam veterans, they were like, this is the only thing our government did for us. How could you do this? And I would be like, okay, there's two things that Vietnam veterans, you know, stand for. And um, one is especially um, is that veterans will never be treated like they were. And they have stood strong on that and they are honoring and we honor veterans. We, will, I, we cannot go back to that day um, where the people like Tommy Clack, um, who was spit on, came back with only one limb and was spit on. Um, I just can't even imagine. But the second thing that the Vietnam veterans did and have is fullest possible accounting. They say, and I know you know this better than me, huh, Pete. <laughs> they say, welcome home, brother. And I would say to them, you know, this, I understand that this was an honor, but it wasn't the right, it was, it, it, we need to welcome this, that, this uh, Vietnam veteran home too. He has a name. And so, um, but my mother would say to you, she was still living today. And as, as she said many times, when anybody said anything or said, I can't believe you're doing this or whatever they would say, she'd say, he's not your son. He's my yeah. son. Yeah. There you have it. That's Did, did Michael's uh, death spur you to join the Air Force? So um, I... Um, Four years after Michael was killed, um, they, uh, recruiters came to my school and uh, of all service, and they said, uh, travel, training, and an education. And in my 17-year-old mind, I thought, I need, I, I got to get out. Well, there's a song about I got to get out of this place. <laughs> That's a song from the Vietnam War, but I think, but it's, it's, but in my 17 year old mind, I've got to get out of, I've got to go. And I joined the next day. I joined the Air Force though, because my brother, um, I, was, I was familiar with the Air Force just a little bit, but I didn't understand his service and his sacrifice. And, and it took, I mean, here I am all these years later, still learning about, you know, what everyone has done and given, but, so yes, in a way, but I was so young, but now I'm all in. <laughs> well, okay, you joined the Air Force as enlisted. You were a basic airman, which yes. is the lowest rank in the military <laughs> Air Force. 40 years later, you retired as a full bird colonel. Any regrets whatsoever? Nothing was easy. Um, I, I can't say I have any regrets. The Lord has, you know, just really blessed my life. And, and as I look back and uh, even, oh, especially with Michael, I, I, sometimes, you know, I didn't ask to be M Michael's sister. <laughs> this was not something I signed up for. Um, but I just, as I look back on that time, it was, 
but I was brought through it. And everything that I look back on in my life, I was brought through it and I was, I became stronger. And um, so I, I can't say I, I have regrets, um, but there was nothing easy. Now you went through quite an ordeal uh, with Michael and you were in the Air Force. Uh, did you receive any flack from the Air Force or your supervisors during this ordeal? Well, I, ca I can't say I received flack. I mean, um, I was assigned at the time I was um, in reserve status. So I did my reserve duty up at the Pentagon and um, in public affairs, <laughs> no, no less. Um, and so when I knew we were going to go public, I told the Air Force leadership that we were going to go public, that I knew Michael was in the tomb and this is what was going on. And, and they were, so there was some distancing, you know, but that happens anywhere. You know, it's like when somebody's doing something and you don't know if they're right and then you go, oh, you're going to step back. But so I felt that. And I was only a captain, and I shouldn't say only a captain, but a captain. And so I, I was going up for major that year, but who, who doesn't make major? <laughs> so so I we talked about my rank and I said to my family and my mother in particular, um, it doesn't really matter. What we're doing is the right thing. And, and so if there was flack, um, I just plowed through it, but it was, it was hard. It was hard on did every Air front. Force, did the Air Force offer you any support at all through all this? Um, yes, I, I would meet with, I would meet with some of them, my leadership. And, um, and then it, it went, well, once Michael was identified, you could see that the, the incredible um, ceremony with the missing man formation, the color guard, the, the Air Force um, leadership that came, they, they were very supportive. And, and before he was identified, they had a family, a, 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 a general who came down to visit the family. So there was um, support, but it was all like sort of tense. <laughs> I think Mary has another question, Mary. I do. Um, yes, I do. Thank you. Do you know what would have happened had they identified the remains and it not been Michael? Um, I no, I, I don't. But I will tell you this: I uh, in one of my comments, um, I said, you know, at, at this point with the phone calls that we were we were receiving, it's someone, it's somebody. So, um, but there were no documents leading to anybody else. Yeah, you know. I mean, so, I, I, when I tell that story, I always say they were like really, really certain it was him. But you know, on the off chance, I wonder would they have, you know, put put the remains back. I, you know, you just wonder what they might have done had it not really been him. And it, it is, I think, it's kind of comforting also to know that while we may have a missing uh, soldier uh, in the now or in the future, we'll never have another unknown because of DNA and the and the and the technology. But uh, so that's got to be you know somewhat comforting for so many. I think. Well. There, there wasn't an unknown. He wasn't unknown. They made an unknown. And, and I, I, I'm conflicted, you know, with the memorial. And as much as I, I've gone there before I knew Michael was there, and I've been there after Michael was disinterred, and I understand the mission, and I understand the devotion to, and, um, and what it means to everyone in our nation, but then I go to the Vietnam Wall and there's 58,000 names. So an unknown, but as opposed to knowing names and, and then what it, how important it was to have a Vietnam unknown to, to take someone's name away from him. So I, I'm conflicted with all of that because to be known is, is better, but, but it is um, a national monument, Arlington Cemetery, and I, 
um, and the tomb of the unknowns. And I respect that. It's just, I just, um, I don't know. I, I don't think I'm articulating. Well, no, I, and I think this is very uh, interesting um, point of view for me to hear because I'm, your, your perspective of it is so different than anyone else's, you know, like even somebody who maybe they don't know where their loved one is, they're still going to have a different perspective standing there at the tomb, watching that ceremony, wondering if it's them, than you knowing that your brother was in there, you know, so I, you bring a very unique perspective to something that I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it that way. To me, I look at that and think he represents them all, you know, and, and it, yeah, that was, it, it's, yeah, I, you gave me a lot to think about. <laughs> You have to also keep in mind that uh, as difficult as it was for Patricia and her family, they did have some kind of, as Patricia said, that word closure. Uh, we still have boys missing from Vietnam and women too. And those families have not received any kind of closure at all. Uh, uh, Patricia, well, just the number of missing from World War II is astounding. Still in about 70,000, I believe. Yeah. And they're still finding bodies on Tarawa. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Patricia, you mentioned uh, uh, about the Green Beret that believes that we left uh, some POWs in Vietnam. Uh, I will have to agree with him. Uh, coming from intelligence, I know of a couple that were left there. I also know that if people would read the book, Dereliction of Duty, they will be shocked to find out that when we signed the Paris Peace Accords, the North Vietnamese agreed to uh, release the POWs in North Vietnam. They did not agree to any POWs released from Laos, Cambodia, or South Vietnam. So no one is going to convince me that we didn't leave people over there. Uh, Patricia? Um, you know, a lot of people are going to believe that it's difficult to believe that the military ordered certain documents destroyed. You want to, you want to uh, reply to that? Uh oh, did we lose Patricia? Sean, Looks like we, we may have, we may have lost her briefly. There she is. She just popped back in. Okay, sorry. I don't know what happened, but thank you. Um, Did you uh, hear my question? You might have to repeat it. <laughs> so that's uh, I think a lot of people find it difficult to believe that the military would order documents like that destroyed. Um, I, it's hard for me to understand why they'd want to destroy because they think that someone has not been identified properly or whatever. Uh, I'm very critical of that, are you? I am, and, and I, it's really unfortunate that I'm, I'm, I see too much and I know too much, but um, one of the criteria of selecting an unknown was um, that he could not ever be identified. And I was like, but, so that's why they would, you know, say destroy everything. But yeah. uh, that's what you know. A decision was made not to destroy everything, and and if it, it, it part, you know, the part of the plan. I mean, that that goes back to me. Is truth will be revealed. It might be revealed now. It'll be or be revealed later. You know, and and we can identify with that with what's happening in our nation not to go into that, but um, truth will be revealed um, one way or another. And it, it, so it was revealed. And um, for that, I'm forever grateful too, um, even though it's hard to accept of how it came about. Let me check with our Zoom master. Sean, are we okay on time? We are doing great. Uh, we have about eight minutes left till 8.30. Um, but you know, if, if uh, you know, we're into it, uh, we can take a bit of time afterwards. Okay, well, uh, that sounds good to me. Uh, yeah, uh, Patricia, you just returned from a very special ceremony. Tell us about that. 
So um, I went to St. Louis um, this past week um, because of May 11th of 1972, Michael was killed and, um, and the class of 70 has joined forces of the United States Air Force class of 70 that Michael was a part of. Um, the living members obviously joined forces and are helping um, the POW MIA museum that is being established at Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis where Michael is, um, is buried. And so in that museum, they, there's supposed to be uh, eventually a Lieutenant Blassey room, but it's not about Michael, it's about all POWs and MIAs and making sure that um, as this um, veterans uh, club wants to do that their memories never die, that you know they all have names and we don't wanna forget. And so um, it was really a special moment. It was actually a virtual event because of the situation that we're in in our nation today, but, um, and also because you know, the, the museum isn't quite ready for prime time. They're still wanting, you know, to do some more building and things like that. So yeah, it was really nice. I think it's God's grace that, that your mother did see her son come home, but your father didn't. Is that correct? Yes. So um, that was, that's really hard um, because I think sometimes my father was living his life through Michael in some ways, because my father just served in World War II, um, but it wasn't um, operational, I don't believe. He didn't talk about it, but from what I understand, um, of what I know, it wasn't operational. And so my, my father, and, and especially Michael was the firstborn, but he, he just loved him and identified with him. So when Michael was killed, it was um, my father um, built a trophy case downstairs and sat down there a, a lot with the flag and the medals and things like that. And um, actually my father is um, buried at Jefferson Barracks as well. Not in the same area as my uh, brother, but um, he, my father didn't want any uh, a burial, any anything, no gathering of family and, and the executor honored that. Um, but once I saw my father's tombstone, I just, uh, it was, it was a tough uh, pill to swallow because on my father's tombstone at Jefferson Barracks is, um, George C. Blassie. I don't have it memorized exactly, but George Blassie, father of first Lieutenant Michael Blassie. Oh, wow. So he went to his grave with, and that's what he wanted to be remembered by, by so. Well, bless his heart. You, uh, you visited Vietnam a few years back. Did you think about, or did you visit the crash site or could you get to the crash site? I almost got to the crash site. So they, um, they allowed me um, a escort um, and we went from Saigon and it was quite the drive to Anlock, but um, I, I wasn't quite there, but it's um, rubber plantations now. And, you know, you just don't know what you don't know, but we got too close to where he, um, he crashed. But going to Vietnam for me, um, and we were talking about this a little earlier before the show, I... I had to rearrange my brain about Vietnam. It's beautiful, it's vibrant. And I, I to me, it's, it was dark. And I, I went there and I was like, people are having fun and vacationing. And, and I was like, oh, I was stuck in my own world about what happened back in 72. And it's still sad to me, but, um, and, and, and the other part that really I struggle with is that, you know, we went in there because are we continued the war after the French, after the French left um, because of the threat of communism. And um, 
it's still communist today. Yeah. Well, I like struggle you, with that. I know. So what was it? But like you said too, the North is still almost like a third world country. But yeah. when you go to the Southern regions of Vietnam, uh, it's prosperous. They right. still have limited capitalism there. I guarantee you that the, the communists have always known if we want to make money, we better be capitalist. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, uh, Ellie, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's nothing Ellie, wrong uh, with that. Mom, do you have any questions? Anybody have any questions for Patricia? Okay. Well, Patricia, you know, I love you to death and, and thank you so much for doing this tonight. Give us your final thoughts. Give us, give some, give us uh, some some thoughts of the, the whole ordeal, what your parents had to go through, how they handle all this, and and uh, uh, you close it out, young lady. Well, first, I, I, whenever I I speak, I I know that there are people in the audience, and I mean. You, you, we don't just don't know what we don't know about people that we're talking to and we all have our own thoughts and I certainly hope that um, how we came across today Pete that we didn't offend um, with thought because today in this culture you know it's like you know every people get offended and and that, that's not what we're here to do it's just to tell a story and i'm not saying that the blassey family was completely right you know but all i know is that you know we wanted we stood for the truth and i i do believe that there is um it's important to be able to do that and more and more um it's difficult to do so because people criticize. I mean, I remember what someone told me, you know, if that's not your brother in the tomb, you should pay the government for all that you're doing, uh, all the um, effort uh, to disinter. And I was just like, oh. oh my gosh. So, and then another comment was, so how many other um tombs are you going to go after? And I was like, you know, so uh, on, um, in, in the media, these little sound bites that when we were on the TV, we would say things, but I couldn't tell the story. And I, I mean, we would never have gone to any tomb if the, if the documents had not indicated it was him. So, it's just so, um, but all of that hurt, but it it didn't hurt enough not to stand strong for the truth. Patricia, if I may, as a Vietnam veteran, I think you did absolutely the right thing. God bless you. Thank you. Someone asked, uh, is Michael's name on the wall? I'm pretty sure it is, isn't it? Yes, so they, they changed you know, the symbol next to his name. I think if you're still missing, it's a cross and then it becomes a diamond after he was found or it's vice versa, I think. But there's a symbol next to each name. Co that... Correct. I, I'll, as you say, I, I can tell you. there's Thank a, you, it's Mary. A, yeah, I said, you know, I would know. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a it's they don't they don't want us to say it's a cross anymore so it's a plus sign oh my goodness yeah oh, so anyway. guess what it's a cross that's <laughs> what i still say because i'm a rebel uh it's a cross <laughs> next to their name and when the um when they are found if they're ever found i'm sorry that's not right it's a oh my god my brain see this is what happens when you haven't done a tour in a year because of covid they do. They update it with a diamond in the in the symbol if they're found. That's what it is. So it's a cross if they're killed. It's a um, something if they're missing, and then they put a diamond in it when they're found. And so the they, they can be updated, and they're going to put a circle around the around it the symbol if they're ever found alive. But there are no circles on the wall, so the only circles are every 10 rows to so that you can count easier as you you know count the big call the big the big ones but yeah there's so none of our mias have been found alive 
Right. Yeah. Not one I that we know of. Where am I at? <laughs> oh, there you are, right in the middle it's, of the flags. I think it's. Yeah, if it, I think it's the other way around, uh, Mary. I, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, yeah, it's a diamond. If you're, uh, if you lo lost your life, right. You're missing. Yeah. And I think yes. they superimpose and, the diamond on the cross uh, if you're found. But that's I might, right. If I have the minute, if you don't mind, Sean, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, Colonel uh, Blasi, uh, uh, thank you for your sharing your story. Uh, thank you very much. I, I flew up to Vietnam in 1970. Uh, I have mixed emotions listening to your story. Uh, the first emotion, if you don't mind, is I am shocked that they couldn't recognize his body from a crash. Um, and were, was, were the two people in the aircraft? It's a two seat aircraft. Uh, but it, but that was flown, uh, it was a one seat. Um, okay, so there and was he was no, alone, yeah. That, that's what I was wondering, was there another body? Right. With, but there is so many indications of the type of aircraft. I just, anyway, I won't go into that. I'm shocked that they, that they couldn't recognize it, but thank you for what you did. And I agree with uh, Ken, you did what was right and you returned his, his body as a Vietnam veteran. And I'm the president of a chapter here in, in the state uh, oh. that uh, you know, there's still 1600 missing, as you know, maybe a little few more than 1600 that they are not recovered, but uh, yes. pursue that a Vietnam veterans still do that. At every one of our meetings, we go over those who are still missing in action, and especially the body not recovered. Uh, and we still fight uh, as long as they're found as you did to get them brought back home for their loved ones. Larry, this is thank Pete. You. And, uh, yeah. Pete, thank you for bringing them on. Or on. Well, this this <laughs> was outstanding. Ways to death. There, there's, the time is running out in Vietnam for our missing in action. The soul acidity, is now starting to deteriorate the bones and soon they will be gone. There, there will be nothing left of our missing in action. So uh, there are so many dedicated people still over there uh, digging through hopeful remains. They're, they're going to sites that never have been uh, uh, investigated before. Uh, but God bless them, time's running out for the boys. All right. Any more questions for Patricia? Anybody want to jump in here? Okay. Patricia, I want to uh, uh, close this out with a, a quote from Myra McPherson. Above all, Vietnam was a war that asked everything of a few and nothing of most in America. And I don't think that's true. Mike gave his all. Uh, all of us did our best over there. It was a war that was divided this country. Uh, I hope that never happens again, although we're divided now over several issues. Uh, we were called baby killers when we came home. Now we're called heroes. And we were neither. We were just another generation that answered their call to duty and did the best we could under impossible rules of engagement. But God bless America. God bless you, Patricia, for your story. Uh, love you to death, young lady. Uh, what a great, and your family, God bless the Blassie family. Uh, this story is so special because it will never, ever be repeated. Uh, you, <laughs> you young lady are going down in history. What do you think? About <laughs> I do remember thinking, who can I call? What did they do when that, but no one had this happen and I didn't know who to call. <laughs> it, it's a story that will forever be remembered, never repeated. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a real privilege and I, um, I'm so glad to have joined you. Thank you. Oh, oh you, are you still working on the book? I will. I will get back to it. Okay. Yeah. Let's do so. Uh, more people need to know this story. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, folks. I guess we we'll close out for the night. What a what a great great program we had. Thanks to Patricia Blassie. I call her Patricia, but actually she's Colonel Blassie. No, 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 no. no. Okay. 
Everybody had a good evening. Uh, Pete Mecca signing off. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.